Greetings. My name is Phil Gregory, and I'm a professor in physics and astronomy at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. About two years ago now, I was shocked by an announcement from the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization that I read in Scientific American. Here it is. Only 60 years of farming left if soil degradation continues. 60 years is no time at all. What use is all our technology without food? The primary causes of soil degradation include chemical intensive farming, plowing or tillage, current livestock management, deforestation, and global warming. To keep up with the global food demand, the United Nations estimates 6 million hectares of new farmland will be needed every year. Instead, 12 million hectares are lost each year through soil degradation. For comparison, the area of England is only 13 million hectares. Compared to what we need, we are going backwards at a rate of 18 million hectares per year, or the equivalent of one England and one Ireland each year. But there is some good news, which is what this video is all about. If we change our agricultural practices in response to a recent revolution in soil biology, we can avoid the looming collapse of agriculture and at the same time go a long way to solving global warming. Clearly this is a big deal. Understanding this revolution is crucial to our survival. So let's go through the 10 important new insights that have emerged, starting with the invisible universe in the soil. Here is the first insight. Microbes are the secret behind healthy soil. Each teaspoon of healthy soil contains as many microbes as the population of humans on Earth. In the past 30 years, science has begun to draw back the curtain on this invisible universe. Here are some of the microscopic and visible actors that make up the soil food web. At the base of this predator-prey relationship are the bacteria and fungi, which are circled in blue. Apart from their role in recycling nutrients from dead plant and animal matter, bacteria and fungi are also able to extract and store all of the nutrients that plants require from the rock, sand, silt and clay as well as nitrogen from the atmosphere. When the bacteria and fungi are eaten by their predators, the stored nutrients are released in plant available form right next to the plant roots. We need a hierarchy of predators to preserve a stable balance of predators and prey. In nature, high biodiversity translates to population stability. Here is the second insight. Plants attract and feed the microbes with carbon compounds in exchange for all the other elements they require. This is nature's bartering system. Plants are the conductors of nature's bartering system. Here's how they do it. Up to 40% of the sugars, carbohydrates, and proteins that a plant produces are released from its roots as root exudates to attract and feed the microbes the plant requires. For the microbes, they are like cakes and cookies. The plant is also able to control the soil pH along its root through the biotic glues of the particular microbes it attracts. Exudates are also released from the above ground plant surfaces as well. So in healthy soil conditions, leaf surfaces are protected by a layer of microbes held by the strong biotic glues. Insight number three. Microbes build a stable porous soil structure with their biotic glues and fungal strands, creating underground cities to live in. Bacteria secrete biotic glues that stick soil mineral and organic matter together in what are called microaggregates. Fungal strands tie the microaggregates together to form larger aggregates. You can think of the microaggregates as bricks, which the fungi assemble into houses with doors and windows that provide passageways for air and water to penetrate to great depths. Here is insight number four. Plowing destroys the soil structure, kills the microbes, and creates compaction zones, transforming living soil into dirt. Plowing slices and dices the soil structure built by bacteria and fungi. Those underground cities were home to a diverse ecosystem capable of providing all of the nutrients required by plants 
without the need for chemical fertilizers. Notice the gulls feasting on those exposed creatures. Without the biotic glues and living plant roots, soil is easily washed away by rain or blown away during periods of drought, leading to serious soil erosion. This picture shows a dust storm approaching Stratford, Texas in 1935. Dust storms like this destroyed the crops and many died from dust pneumonia. Insight number five. The Green Revolution, the use of synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides is only required because we are trying to grow crops in dirt. Plants become addicted to nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium fertilizers and stop feeding the microbes, which shuts down nature's bartering system. Insight number six. Plowing releases a lot more CO2 into the atmosphere, which is a climate warming greenhouse gas. This slide shows the research of Dr. Don Rykowski and colleagues at the USDA Agricultural Research Services in 1998. They used a piece of equipment called Mr. Jim, standing for a mobile research gas exchange machine, to measure how much soil carbon was released into the atmosphere as climate warming CO2 emission during a given period of time following plowing. On the left, is shown the CO2 emission from one square meter of untilled soil used as a control, which amounted to 11 grams of CO2 over a 24-hour period. Notice how that number increases depending on how deep the soil was plowed. Plowed to a depth of 11 inches or 280 millimeters, the CO2 emission was 15 times larger. Of course, the CO2 emission is invisible to the eye so it came as quite a shock to see how much extra CO2 emission occurred as a result of plowing. When the measurement times were extended to 21 days, the extra CO2 emission was still 10 times larger. We now know that plowing causes a lot of soil carbon to be converted to CO2 and transforms living soil into dirt. Time to retire the plow. To stop erosion and save carbon in the soil, we need to retire the plow. Insight number seven, restore nature's bartering system. How do we rebuild the soil biology? By inoculating the dirt with a thin layer of first-class compost or by spraying with a compost extract or compost tea made from the compost. It is important to ensure that the compost is teeming with a good selection of soil microbes using a soil microscope. We need to stop plowing and stop using synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides. We also need to ensure a good cover of plants to provide the root exudates to feed the microbes. Copy nature, save money, save humans. Move to regenerative agriculture where we rebuild the soil biology and sequester more carbon at the same time as we grow food. Most agricultural soils have been degraded and this is not a situation we want to sustain. So we need to move beyond sustainability to regenerative agriculture. Nature can provide all the nutrients that plants need from the rock, sand, silt, clay, and the atmosphere without the need for plowing or fertilizers. What about livestock grazing? According to the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, 62% of agricultural land is used for grazing. The areas shown in brown in this NASA image are dryland regions that are the current and former grasslands of the world which are turning or have turned to desert. Desertification is a huge problem. Conventional wisdom has it that one of the main causes of desertification is overgrazing by herbivores like cattle, sheep, and goats, which kill the grasses turning the land to bare earth. This is especially true in regions of the earth which have a few months of rainfall followed by many months of drought like large parts of Africa. According to one of my agricultural heroes, the African biologist Alan Savory, we were once just as certain that the earth was flat. As Alan Savory has shown, it is not about numbers, it's all about timing. It's our failure to manage plant recovery time that leads to overgrazing and land desertification. Insight number eight. We need to manage plant recovery time. Continuous grazing is a common practice in which livestock have unrestricted access throughout the grazing season. A typical native grassland contains more than 100 plant species, 
and herbivores, like humans, have their preferences, and from these they choose the freshest growth. An important new insight is to not allow the livestock to eat these grasses a second time as they start to regrow before photosynthesis has recharged the root. In drought-prone areas, this repeated cropping kills the grass, leaving bare ground with no plants to feed the soil microbes. This leads to desertification and a loss of soil carbon. How does nature prevent overgrazing? Here is an aerial view of a herd of wildebeest. The native grasslands co-evolved with vast herds of herbivores, like bison in North America or wildebeest in Africa, together with ferocious predators. They are bunched together for protection. They are only safe inside the herd. The herd has to keep moving to avoid eating their own waste, so they don't get to eat the same grass a second time just as it starts to regrow, which would stress the plant roots. By the time the herd returns from their migration, the grass is fully grown and ready to be eaten. Insight number nine, imitate nature and reverse desertification. Alan Savory has been teaching ranchers how to emulate the wild herbivores and their predators. One way is to use cheap portable electric fencing to divide the original pasture into many much smaller paddocks. The herd is concentrated by the electric fence, which emulates the predators. They only stay in a given paddock for a short period, so they don't get to eat the grass as it starts to regrow. In this image, the cattle are concentrated at one end as they move to the next paddock. The cattle don't get to return to this paddock until the grass has regrown. This practice, together with their concentrated dung, leads to much healthier grass, which can feed a lot more cattle and the people who depend on them. In the top right, we see Neil Dennis, a Saskatchewan rancher spending 20 minutes setting up the next paddock. Wait a minute. Aren't we supposed to eat less meat? Methane produced by ruminants is a potent greenhouse gas. But we have been ignoring a whole other side to the story. When herbivores are adaptively grazed to emulate nature, there's a net reduction in greenhouse gas. The greenhouse gas emission of methane is more than compensated for by the amount of atmospheric carbon sequestered in the soil. Some references to the recent science are given on this slide. Our new knowledge shows how cattle, sheep, and goats can be a big part of the solution, not a problem. Insight number 10. Regenerative agriculture can halt the annual increase of CO2 emission in the atmosphere. At the 2015 Paris Climate Meeting, the French government announced an ambitious agricultural program aimed at sequestering large amounts of atmospheric carbon. As of November 2016, 33 countries have joined this initiative. The goal is to increase the amount of carbon stored in the soil by 0.4% per year through changes in agricultural practices. This is enough to halt the annual increase in CO2 emission, which is a major contributor to the greenhouse effect and climate change. Already there are examples of individual farmers who have greatly exceeded this goal using regenerative agricultural practices. One well-known example is Gabe Brown in Bismarck, North Dakota, who has increased his soil organic matter from 1.7% to 11% in a period of 10 years. This corresponds to an increase in soil carbon from 1% to 6%. Here is a concluding video that pulls all these insights together, produced by Kiss the Ground. If you're like most people, you're probably feeling a little hopeless about climate change and the damage we've done to our planet. Well now, there's a new way to look at climate change and how to deal with it that might just turn that hopelessness into hope. Climate change, as we know, is all about too much carbon in our atmosphere. But carbon is not our enemy. It's the building block of life. Everything alive is made of it, even us. The problem and the solution are simply a matter of balance. Let's step back and look at the five pools where carbon is stored on planet Earth. Starting about 500 million years ago, when plants first appeared on land, carbon began to cycle in an amazing balance between these pools, a balance that allowed for life as we know it to evolve. Then one life form, that would be us, figured out how to extract carbon from the fossil pool, which was pretty much a timeout zone for carbon. 
We've been burning it for energy, putting into play, and disrupting that balance. The way we manage land and do agriculture is moving even more carbon into the atmosphere. Specifically, we've moved 880 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is heating up the planet and destabilizing our climate. The oceans have absorbed a lot of this excess carbon, throwing off the ocean's balance, resulting in ocean acidification and accelerating a mass extinction of sea life. So in order to save life as we know it, of course we need to stop burning fossil carbon. The big question is, where do we put this excess carbon to get the cycle back in balance? The good news is that the answer is literally right under our feet. It's the soil. Plants, using sunlight and water, naturally perform photosynthesis. They pull carbon in from the air and turn it into carbohydrates, sugars. Then they pump some of these sugars down through the roots to feed microorganisms who use that carbon to build healthy soil. Voila, carbon moved. The plants pump it in and the soil stores it. Nature's living technology is amazing. Scientists have recently discovered that applying a thin layer of compost can help regenerate healthy soil, setting up an ongoing feedback loop that brings more and more carbon into the soil each year. Together with other regenerative practices like not tilling the soil, planting trees and cover crops, and planned grazing, we can build and retain billions of tons of soil carbon. This is carbon farming. This is regenerative agriculture. Woo! <laughs>